Hi, and welcome to Pass Her the Mic, a lifestyle, wellness, personal development mini series with your host, yours truly, Deandra Kanu. Let's welcome our guest, Sarah Garrett, to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. No problem. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited because this is our first episode. Not sure if this is going to actually air as the first episode, but she is letting me harass her today on the episode. Can't wait. Um, so let's just start off with how Sarah and I met. Do you remember how we met? Yeah, so it was through a mutual friend, a Jazzy, and we did just like a picnic kind of nearby, I think. Um, and we were just like all hanging out for the day. Yeah. It was very relaxed. It was. It was I met her on Easter. I think it was Easter. Oh, Easter. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last year when I first moved to LA and from there I've just been following you mm-hmm. and keeping up with your content and I just admire and appreciate the way that you do your content. Thank you. I think, I feel like you've grown since I even started following you, mm-hmm. but essentially I just feel like you're very much into empowering women and their food decisions and the healthy lifestyle, but also having a fun lifestyle. So it's not so strict and um, constrained. So tell me like a little bit about how you got into that. Yeah. So I feel like I have the cliche story of, I wanted a revenge body after a breakup. Um, and that was in college and I had no background on nutrition, health. I feel like I was really heavily in the time where, you know, people were still bragging about not eating all day and then drinking all night. Um, And I was in a sorority too. So I was around a lot of that talk. And so um, for me, it was like, I had just gotten out of a relationship. I wasn't happy with where I was at physically. um, And I had gained about 30 pounds my freshman and sophomore year of college. And I just didn't notice it until it was like, I looked in the mirror, I was like, girl, damn. And, um, you know, it was, it was just a reflection period for me. And I really wanted to do the work on myself. However, because I didn't have the education, social media wasn't really like that in the sense of like spreading great information. I kind of just figured it out on my own and I ended up losing, um, that weight. However, I took an unhealthy approach one I wouldn't recommend to people now. And it came with like a lot of trials and tribulations and I created an unhealthy relationship with food and it was just a really big strain in my life because I thought once I lost that weight, I would be happy. And then I wasn't. And then I had a laundry list of new problems. And so my love for helping other women is to avoid that period of time, right? It's to avoid the the trials that are just not necessary. Um, And, you know, the self-hatred that can come from a journey like that, that you think is going to be so empowering. Um, And I really struggled with that on my own. And so that's really why I wanted to make that difference for other women. So what was your relationship with food growing up like then? If, yeah. You know. So I feel like I didn't really have any negative or positive thoughts about food. I was a volleyball player and I knew I needed to eat. I was pretty active. Um, so I never really thought too much about it. I ate the way I ate. My aunt, I grew up with her um, and she was pretty much always buying like organic and things like that. Um, but I also, my, you know, my first job in high school was five guys and I was eating that every day and like I was fine and I was eating like the school lunch. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really until college when I had to make more of my own choices and the options that we had in college, I had meal swipes for like um, Chick-fil-A and Pizza Hut. And so that's what I was eating and that's what they provided. And so, yeah, my relationship with food didn't really come to like a conscious place until I was in college. And so you're saying that in college, okay, you started off as what you considered more of like your standard body type for your body weight or whatever it was. Right. And then through your transition, through your relationship and your breakup and, you know, the things that college brings, the drinking mm-hmm. and, you know, the right, healthy right. food swipes, you gain this weight. And then after that fact is when you were like, I'm going to get into nutrition. Is that when you decided to get your certification or? No. So um, I got into fitness and nutrition at the beginning. It was like the summer going into my junior year of college. And okay. so during those two years, junior and senior year, that's when I was kind of taking an unhealthy approach with food. It was like heavy on the food restriction. Um, I was over exercising um, and I just had just a really negative thought around food and just working out. It was always like a punishment um, rather than like, oh, I get to do this. And so it wasn't until I graduated college when I had realized, you know, I still wasn't happy regardless of the way that my body looked. And it was such a defeating feeling. And um, I just started to follow more people on social media that were coaches and people who were spreading information in an educational way. And I opened up my eyes in the sense of like, I can take a different approach. And so I started taking a different approach for myself. I started building inspiration from other people online. And I was like, oh, there's like online coaches, like people do this for a living. I was like, what are they really preaching? Like, what are they really doing? And then that's what inspired me to get certified and do more on the nutrition side as well, because even just like a basic CBT isn't going to give that to you. Right. So who would you say is someone that you admired in the space of 
Yeah. Even if it's like influencing. And how do you feel about, that's another thing. How yeah. do you feel about fitness influencers mm-hmm. who aren't coaches or don't um, have like the background and certification? Yeah. So there's definitely a gray area, right? So there's the fitness influencers who are more so just sharing what they do and not really giving advice. And I think that that can be a safe space. Um, but then there's, you know, when they cross that bridge of like going too far and giving advice or more personal advice, where they're saying you will get the results from doing X, Y, Z, and they don't have really anything to back that up. That's when it's just like, I don't love seeing that. Um, I feel like for me personally, I follow so many people who are similar to me that I don't see it as much. You know, you, you get on your feed what you're like, you know, are interacting with. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a gray area. And who did you look up to at the time where you were like, I yeah. want to study you, I want to be like you? Yeah, so I consider her a friend now, but her name is Caitlin. She um, has Strive to Thrive, and that's just like another coaching business. Um, and she was like the first, co- one of the first coaches I had seen. And also this, my mentor, Kendall, she also had a fitness coaching business. And now she does more of the business coaching side. Um, but both of them, I was really, really inspired by the impact that they had in the industry. Okay, I love that. I feel like when I was younger, um, what's actually crazy is before I had met a Jazzy, like I used mm-hmm. to always see her stuff popping up and I was like, oh, yeah. I love this. Like she's one of those girls that I feel like preaches body positivity right, right, right. and like loving your body. Like she works out a lot and she talks about her transition through mm-hmm. like looking one way and like being super restrictive and right. not feeling her best. And like obviously people probably gave her criticism because it looks different from when she first came on the scene in the right. fitness industry. So I think anyone who preaches body positivity and doing what's right for your body whatever feels good internally, mm-hmm. even though it may not look a certain way, right. is really important. Absolutely. And just being able to like appreciate your body through different phases. I mean, so many people will compare their bodies to their 16-year-old self. I'm like, you barely had a period, you know? It's just like, how can you be 25 and want to be back into that 16-year-old body? It's just not possible, but it's so hard to detach yourself from it in a sense too. So it's really nice to see women go through these different stages and be like, we have to appreciate like the different stages that we're going through and acknowledge the time in, lo- in our life where we were at that gave us that body because I can't go back to like my premenstrual body. That's just not an option, you know? Yeah. So I guess my question is, how did you learn to love food in a positive way after feeling like you lost the weight and it wasn't in the healthiest manner and you were like, okay, I'm unhappy. I'm still unhappy even though I'm at my maybe ideal weight. I'm not exactly sure. But like, how did you flip the switch into like loving and having a healthy relationship with food and what that looked like in your body transition? And Yeah, so I realized the approach I took didn't make me happy. So I had to change the script and I was seeing other women and that was really the biggest thing. I was like, there are other women who have what I would consider an ideal body type and they have so much flexibility with their diet. I'm like, how are they doing that? And so it was really just like following other women who had what I essentially wanted and that gave me inspiration that it can be done. Um, And then really just understanding nutrition on a deeper level, right? So when I like am taking these courses and furthering my education, you learn so much more about food um, that isn't just like calories in versus calories out. It's more so like, how can this give me energy throughout the day and how can this actually fuel my workout so I can push myself harder and, you know, progressively overload in the gym. You know, I was eating like, I don't know, like maybe like 200 calories before I, I had like a huge leg day and that was like all I had in my stomach and I didn't eat on like 6 p.m. was the last time I ate the night before. Like I had nothing to fuel me for that workout. And so when I look back and I was recognizing, you know, I could be farther if I looked at food as fuel, um, it was a game changer for me too. And just learning more about the body and what it can do. I feel like it's, there's a lot of conflicting information out there. And for me, I find it really hard personally. Right. Because you hear the people who are like fast, do the fasted workout. And then Mm -hmm. you hear you, you're like, hey, like feel your body, which there's so much that plays into it. Obviously, the more research you do, it's like the hormones and like your body weight or like maybe like what you're looking for as far as goals and like the night, the meal that you ate the night before. Right. So tell me like, what is your take on like fasted workout? You're smiling. Yeah. Fasted workouts. What what should you eat before a workout? Like be real granular. I want to know specifics for like women who maybe you're just like, what do I do? Right. So like you said, it can depend on a lot of factors, right? And so the women that I primarily coach are weight training. Um, And so that is going to be different than maybe a Pilates or like a yoga where I wouldn't necessarily say you need to have like this big meal before. Um, But with weight training in our goal is to progressively overload, which means to rather it's increasing your weight per week or increasing the reps per week. You're getting stronger in the gym every week, right? And so a lot of times clients will come and they'll be like, you know, I just 
always feel like I'm going to black out in the middle of my workout or like I, I just don't have the energy to finish. Right. And so that comes from the pre-workout nutrition. And so I always recommend that if you can't get a meal or two before your workout, especially if you're working out in the morning, at least 50 grams of carbs. So, um, so that you can get that energy in your training session to, to really push and see it through. Um, but yeah, again, it's going to, it's going to really depend per, per person. I think it's funny because I recently started doing this maybe like a couple months ago, but I wake up at 6am to go to the gym Mm -hmm. and at 6am I have no energy. I'm I'm half asleep. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to eat at 6am. I don't want to eat at 6am, but I also get scared sometimes eating or drinking coffee on an empty stomach because I've heard what it can do. It tears up your stomach and Mm -hmm. it's not good for your insulin levels or whatever it is, your cortisol. Right. But I have maybe like a handful of blueberries or maybe like a couple pieces of watermelon. Like, how do you feel about that as far as a pre-workout? And I'm weight training. Yeah. I don't think I'm doing heavy enough because I haven't seen a change in my body. Oh my but I'm like, do, how do you feel about that as far yeah. as like me? So like a, a, a bowl of fruit or like a banana running out the door or something like that is perfect before. Um, you know, like I said, I usually recommend that my clients aim for 50 grams. And sometimes, you know, a banana is like what, like 35 grams of carbs right there. Um, you can bring bana- a banana with you on the go. You can also have a snack in your bag. So if you feel like you're halfway through your workout and that's what's considered an intro workout when you have like a snack mm. at the gym or during your workout, um, you can bring that with you. So if you feel like you're having low energy, you can have a quick carb spike and that's going to allow you to, again, push through and maybe lift five pounds heavier than you were, were able to last time. Okay. And that's another thing. I've never thought to eat during a workout. Yeah. I didn't know how that was going to go with like your digestion and like, yeah. So you can yeah. eat and then yeah. instantly go back to So you want to, yeah, you can go right back to it. So you're going to want to pick a quick digesting carb. So like, for example, a bowl of oatmeal, you probably won't physically get the energy from that for about an hour to an hour and a half after eating it because of the digestion process. However, a quick digesting carb, if you're having like um, a banana or some people, I'm sure you've seen people like have rice crispy treats. Yeah. Like it's that quick carb, that quick um, spike and that's where you're going to get your energy from in your training session. Um, I feel like before in my like early coaching days, I've always been like, yeah, just have like a rice crispy or whatever. Now I'm like, you know, let's have a, let's have some fruit. Like let's, you know, take, let's still have a whole food if we can, or, um, you know, just taking that approach rather than just like shoving a processed quick carb down your throat. But yeah. Okay. So we've, we've made it to the gym. We've, we've talked about the pre-workout snack. We've gone to the gym. Let's say post gym. Mm -hmm. I hear so many different things about eat right after the gym or don't eat right after the gym or eat Mm -hmm. this right after, eat protein right after the gym or eat carbs because this is when your body's metabolizing. You know, what do you think is the best post gym snack? Yeah. Again, I think it's overcomplicated. I think the main thing you need to be worrying about specifically for your goals is how much you're eating in, in a day as a whole. As quickly as you eat it, I don't think the average person needs to pay as much attention. If you're a bodybuilder, it might be a little bit different if you're planning to step on stage and compete. Um, but for the average person, which is most people listening who are looking for advice, eat as quickly as you can so that you're not like, you know, starving after a workout. Um, but focus on high protein and good amount of carbs after, but you don't need to be rushing. It's not like, it's, it's not going to do much of a difference for you, whether you have it 10 minutes after your workout or an hour. Uh, But again, for the average person, just pay attention to the overall day and how much you're consuming. Okay. So for you, you're saying it basically doesn't matter. Yeah. It's it's not that deep. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of people in the same sense are asked that question. They think, Oh, like, can I eat before bed? And there's all these other things, right? It's all these rule timings around food and essentially like just do what works best for you when it comes to meal timing pay attention to how you feel especially with the nighttime a lot of people are like oh can't eat late you're gonna gain weight it's not necessarily that you're gonna gain weight it's the digestion process is so different from like going into REM sleep and it's two processes butting heads and so you want to go to bed you want to finish eating around two hours before going to bed just so that you can finish the digestion process and then you can enter this new process but it's not like you're gaining fat right and so it's like if you're hungry at 9 p.m and you're going to bed at 9 30 like and you really don't go to bed starving you're probably gonna have a harder time falling asleep but um yeah I'm kind of rambling now (laughs) well no you're making you're making a lot of sense and I love that you're saying that because like me personally something that I found I feel like I'm in my best shape when I am giving myself two hours at least before bed Mm -hmm. I sleep the best I feel like I wake up feeling the best. Yeah. Um, but if I am starving, of course, like having something maybe like more protein based instead of carb based, I don't know, that just makes me feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also we obviously understand that everybody has different body types. Everyone has different things going on with their hormones or just where they're starting. So this isn't information that we're saying you have to take it like this, but um, give me your perfect like day of eating. So like yeah. give me like what I eat in a day kind of, you know, when you're trying to lean out and then like a typical 
a meal a day? Yeah, so for starters, I think a lot of people, when they are trying to lean out or cut, they're like, how do I need to change? Like, what foods need do I need to remove or what foods do I need to add? It's more so like the portion sizes of things is really where you want to focus. So like my full day of eating might not be that different physically with the foods that I'm choosing. It's the portion size of them. There are going to be some swaps that I make, um, but for the most part, it's portions. Um, but just like an ideal, like typical day, I, I know you'd be seeing me eat my overnight oats. Like I love a good overnight oats or like an oat or something in the morning. Um, I put some Greek yogurt in there for extra protein, some fruit for some micronutrients. Um, I put some nut butter on there that's a healthy fat, and that's my breakfast of choice. Um, I am someone who is a stickler about not having caffeine on an empty stomach or having it, you know, as soon as I wake up. And so I usually push off caffeine two hours before after waking up and I always have it with a meal. So it's not like I'm having that before I eat my breakfast. So that's typically my situation. I'll have my breakfast. I'll wait a little bit and then I'll have a coffee um, for lunch. Sometimes I'll do like a big salad, but it still has like grains in it. So like a Mexican style salad, chicken, ground beef. Um, a ton of micronutrients from like the spinach and things like that or the salad mix um, and then I'll add like a like half a cup of rice or something like that and then for dinner I love a salmon bowl like I love a fajita bowl like a shrimp bowl um, I'm such a bowl girl so typically all of my breakfasts and lunch pretty much are interchangeable and they're always some type of bowl so is there snacks in there? Are you a snacker or not really? I don't snack as much, but I think it's because I'm so intentional about the way that I set up my meals that I don't really have the urge to. Um, and also understanding that like I've been eating kind of this way for such a long time and your body adapts in the sense that like a lot of people when they start to work with me, they're like, I have these high sugar cravings. I want snacks all the time. And then when you start to change the way that you eat, your body also is going to change in terms of like the cravings and you know what your body wants and what it doesn't want. And so I used to snack a ton, but now I'm like, just snack like that like I don't have the de desire to but it doesn't mean I don't do it a snack usually has a protein source in it for me like a protein shake or um you know I'll have like those chomps from Trader Joe's or something like that just so I can like get a little bit of extra protein in but yeah that's typically what a snack will look like so I guess this seems like to make it super easy for indigestible for people it seems prioritize protein yeah because I'm hearing protein in pretty much every single thing so like mm -hmm. protein to you can you give like some examples of easy proteins to just yeah so again a bowl thing something with a bowl so I'll do like a chicken bowl I'll do um like a like a stir fry with chicken shrimp with chicken or shrimp with um stir fry um you could you can make a sandwich with I do organic deli turkey, a light cheese. You can get a lot of protein there. Um, whenever I have protein shakes, I typically go for a vegan option, and then I'll mix that with frozen fruit, um, some easy protein. Egg whites with my eggs, that's an easy one. Um, if I want, like, a big, like, home-style breakfast, I'll do, like, one egg and a cup of egg whites because it's a ton of protein, lower in fat. Um, and those are probably, like, my main protein sources. Okay. I get frustrated in the gym personally because I feel like I work out, I work out, work out, and I don't see a lot of changes in my body. Mm -hmm. But what I do notice is that whenever I do start to lean out, the first place that loses any weight is mm -hmm. my butt. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like, I'm, okay, guys, I know I'm built like a stallion. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot to lose mm -hmm. in my butt because we're not, it's not like I have a BBL butt, mm -hmm. but that's the first place I lose weight and yeah. I never feel like it falls off my stomach. Like I never feel like it feels off, falls off my back and arms. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that discourages me. And then I'm like, okay, like now I'm trying to like hold on to that, right. but also trying to lose the rest. Yeah. So what would you say as far as like tips for women who feel like they're experiencing the same thing? Like how do we hold on to certain areas or is that even possible? Yeah. So I'm sure you might've heard that you can't spot reduce fat. Right. And so it's kind of the same thing in the sense that you can't decide where you can't decide where the fat's going to leave the body. Right. And if you hold more fat in your glutes, then that might be one of the areas that goes. Like, <laughs> However, there are things you can do to support that. Right. And so again, high protein is going to be really favorable in a, in a situation where you're trying to lose body fat so that you can keep the muscle mass that you do have on your body. Um, continuing to push in the gym and progressively overload. Um, I think that that can be a, another topic for sure, because I think that can be complicated for a lot of people, but you want to still be pushing yourself in your training sessions for sure. Um, and then maybe if you feel like your glute needs a little extra work, maybe that's a session that you give 
you know, another day too specifically. So sometimes I'll have like two leg days, but then I'll also have like a glute fo focused accessory day that's a little bit lower impact, um, but I'm still getting some more repetitions in for my glutes. So there's a couple ways to support it. And then of course, you know, just generally looking at your nutrition, that's going to play a huge role as well. How do you, how many days would you say the average person should be working out? Yeah, average is so hard because everybody has different jobs. Um, I would say, you know, between three and four. I have some clients who generally cannot work out more than three sessions a week and they make amazing progress with those three sessions because they're so intentional. Um, and obviously they're, you're, they are curated for them. Um, but then we have some girls on the team who work out five days a week and that's great for them. So it's so important to look at your lifestyle, what makes sense for you. I think a lot of people set themselves up to fail when they are like overnight nurses and are working like back to back to back shifts, but they're also trying to hit five workouts. Like that just doesn't work for your lifestyle. So let's pick one that's going to decrease the overall stress in your life. You know you're going to be able to show up for and you can push hard for because you have the energy for. So I'd rather have like three really great sessions where your energy is super high and you have um, the capacity to show up for it rather than like five half-assed sessions essentially. That makes sense. And I feel like something that you're you're saying that's recurring is intention, intention, mm -hmm. intention. And I feel like for women, there's fear around losing weight or like getting into the shape that they want to or like feeling their best because there has to be so much intention. I feel like mm -hmm. it becomes your whole world. Like now you have to start, you know, you can meal prep or right. now you have to go to the grocery store and like look for specific things that might be foreign to you or like outside of your understanding. Um, so like what, how can you soothe people's thoughts when it's like the fitness and your well-being is basically going to consume your whole day, I feel like at this point. Like you yeah. have to be thinking about it. You have to be intentional with it, which means mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot of energy. I feel like that scares a lot. I feel like that scares a lot of women. Yeah, it, I think it can be to a level consuming in the beginning, especially because it might be that you're adding in or doing things so differently than your normal life. Um, but I think you start to build an appreciation for the, like the way that you show up and how you see it, not just physically affect you, but mentally, like your mental clarity, your energy throughout the day. And it's like, oh, I want to show up like this. Like, I'm going to go out of my way to show up like this. Like, yes, it was extra work in the beginning, but I understand the, the outcome and what I get out of it. Um, and also one step at a time, like it's so, it's so interesting and so funny to me. Like we always talk about like this fitness journey, this fitness journey, mm -hmm. it's just life. Like, let's be so honest. Like it's just life. You're never going to wake up one day, look in the mirror and be like, I'm going to stop taking care of myself. Like you're never going to do that. You're not on this journey that has an end. You're just living your life and you're trying to feel your best both physically and mentally while you do it. And so when I think you take the pressure off of like, I need to see these results in X amount of time, X, Y, Z for a trip, and you take that pressure off, it becomes so much more manageable and achievable. And does that that's idea of being so afraid of the change, it just becomes a little less frightening when you know you have time to do it and implement it. And I'm always like one step at a time, like you don't need to change your whole process and you know do add five different new things to your routine, pick one, get it down, implement it into your routine, add another, do the same thing, add another. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna realize that you know time goes by, you're starting to see results, but it wasn't overwhelming because you took one step at a time. I feel like with anything fitness related or health related or weight loss related or getting into shape related, there can be stigma to certain people online. Mm -hmm. I feel like you have a presence on Instagram and maybe you've had people in your DMs being like, why are you advocating for women to want to you know, change the way that they look? Or I don't know if you've ever had like someone say hateful things. I know I have whenever I speak about wanting to be in the best shape of my life. Right. I feel like women get kicked back and they're like, that's so anti body positive. But I'm like, right. that's I think that's detrimental to a lot of women yeah. to feel like you should shame someone else for wanting to feel and look their best. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say to those kind of women who look at someone wanting to lose weight or someone wanting to feel their best or someone wanting to like recomposition their body mm -hmm. as a negative thing? Yeah. So I think that we can say that that person needs to look inward, right? It's like they're projecting something and, um, Again, going back to my clients, I, I talk to so many people and potential clients on calls who have that, they're almost afraid to vocalize to me that they want to make physical changes, even though they're on the phone with a trainer who like, that's why they're looking to sign up for the program, but they can't say it. They, they can't really say like, I want to lose X amount of weight or I want to look different. They're like, you know, I love myself, but you know, I just want to feel better. I'm like, you can also vocalize the things that you want to see too. And I think that that's okay. It's we, we are in such a body positive era um, that people are afraid to work on themselves because they think that that's showing them, that's saying, oh, I don't love myself. Like, I don't love my body. You can absolutely love the body you're in 
and want more or want something different or want something that serves you more. A lot of people are in a body that they feel does not serve them. Oh, I, I, you know, walk up the steps and I feel like out of breath, right? And I'm 26 years old or I want to have kids and I want to run around with them. And I, I can't even do that with myself now. And so there's so much same, a shame associated with wanting to change, I think, right now. But um, when you take the time to look inward and understand your why, I think that can kind of help people fear less the, the judgment of wanting to change. Um, also, I always tell people this. I'm like, listen, I want you to get the body of your dreams too. However, you can't hate the body you're in. That's going to get you there. Like, you're going to look back and be so appreciative that that body worked their ass off to get you to where you want to be. And so I think when you take, when you flip the switch like that and look at it from that perspective, you're like, oh, I can create self-love while still working towards something that's going to serve me better. Absolutely. And that's like such an important conversation that I think people need to have is that self-love doesn't mean staying exactly the way that you are. Mm -hmm. I think people think that self-love is, I have to love myself like this and this is infinite and this is the only option. Right. I think real self-love is looking yourself in the mirror and not like necessarily visually, but like reflecting and being mm -hmm. like, do I feel good? Right. When I, when I walk into a room, how do I feel? Right. When I'm going through life, how do I feel? And that can be, how do you visually feel yourself? How do you mentally feel yourself? How do you mm -hmm. physically feel yourself? And then I think true love is being able to change and be the person that you want to be, Absolutely. regardless of, you know, who's telling you what to do or, you know, what society says. It's like mm -hmm. making that change for yourself. So I feel like that's like a really important conversation that needs to be had. And I also want women to feel very comfortable knowing that you can get on a phone with a personal trainer and say, I want to look different. That's right. completely fine. You can look however you want to look mm -hmm. and, and feel empowered in that. And it doesn't mean that you hate yourself. It right. means you love yourself so much that you know what you're capable of and you're capable of putting yourself in a different position visually, mentally, physically than you are right now. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot. It's, it's hard to ask for help. I, it's so interesting that so many women try to do this by themselves for so long and will be in the same cycle for 10 years and they'll, they'll get on the phone with me and they'll be like, you know, I just feel like I should have figured this out myself. And I'm like, why? Like, yeah. who, who taught, who's teaching us? Who in school is telling us how to eat? Who in school is telling us how to move our bodies in a healthy way? Like, why should you know? Like, did your mom know? Did her mom know? Nobody really knows, right? And it's like the same sense of like, Therapists need therapists. Doctors need doctors. Like, all of that. We all need help. No one is above that. And I think that people just feel so much that they need to figure out this fitness thing on their own. And it's so okay to ask for help. And it's so okay to vocalize that you want to be in a different position. And I'm such a stickler on the fact that I know that a fitness journey is just a catalyst for other things. Like, feeling good in your body and treating your body correctly from the inside out is going to allow you to show up better like you like you said hold your head up higher in a room but also it's going to give you mental clarity when you start to feel like an actual human and less of a shell which a lot of people just feel like a shell and don't know it mm -hmm. um and then you start to take care of yourself like wow like I, I can really get through the day like I don't need that nap and all of these things you know you're going to get that promotion like you're going to be able to to travel the way you wanted to you know you're going to be able to attract the type of people in your life that you want because you know that you're you're giving yourself that self-love that now you know that you're worthy enough to receive it from from anyone, you know? I agree. I feel like a common question that a lot of women are going to have and that I sometimes have for other people, mm -hmm. how do you stay motivated? It's, it's fleeting. Motivation is fleeting, right? And I know you hear it all the time, I'm sure, like discipline, discipline. And I think it does come down to that. But again, when you are on this journey for long enough in a healthy, balanced way, you start to feel it when you're not doing it anymore, right? Like I'm self-motivated because I want to feel good during the day. Like I want to feel good when I'm, you know, going through my day-to-day -day emotions. Like I don't want to feel low energy. Like I don't want to feel constipated because I've been eating out for like X amount of days in a row because I know what that feels like. And so even when I travel sometimes, right, I, I like will travel for maybe like two weeks at a time and I'm so like out of my routine in a sense. I come home and I crave it because I know how good I'm going to feel. And so my motivation isn't just a physical, like, I want to look this way. My motivation is I truly want to feel so good. And I know that that comes when I'm on my routine. I feel like, yeah, to me, motivation is discipline, which is, we all know that. Mm -hmm. Habit, because discipline 
becomes your habits. Mm -hmm. Your habits become your disciplines. And then the way that I feel. And I think that people who have maybe never felt really good in their life, like who haven't been in a place where they have a lot of energy, they love the way that they're feeling internally, they love the way that they look physically, maybe they don't have a reference point for like, exactly. this feels really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do that in my life, whether it comes to food, even more recently alcohol, like I haven't really been drinking. Right. I haven't been drinking at all, it doesn't entice me. Mm-hmm. Because I'm starting to realize the way that I feel without yeah. alcohol. Mm-hmm makes me feel so much better than I when I had alcohol so funny because I feel like we're all kind of in that wave like I'm the same like I'll have a like a like a drink or two or whatever when I'm like traveling and sometimes you know like you're gonna have a couple more when you're traveling but like at home I'm like I really have zero desire because it makes me feel like shit for multiple days like the older we get to it's just like so much harder um so yeah I feel you with that for sure it's actually funny to me because whenever I go somewhere and I don't drink, people are always like, oh, my God, like, what happened? Like, you don't right. drink. Right. As if maybe, like, I had, like, some kind of trauma or maybe, like, you know, mm-hmm. I'm recovering, like, alcoholic or yeah. they almost act like it's a disability. Like, oh, right. why don't you drink? What's right. wrong? Right. Versus that's so empowering. Like, congrats. Like, it shouldn't be a social norm for us to, like, drink. It yeah. shouldn't be a social norm where you go to a party where you have to have a drink. Right. And then I have those friends who force, try to force drinking upon right. me. Right. And I'm starting to look at anyone who forces drinking upon me like, you're not my actual friend. Yeah, I've had to have some stern conversations where it's just like, I love you, I value our friendship, but if I say I'm not doing something, bottom line, that's it. Like, I need you to respect that. And, you know, it's been the back and forth of, well, you know, I just want you to have fun. I just, like, I want you to loosen up. Like, I just, like, I don't want you to be stressed or, like, I was like, I can have a good time. And then it's like, all of a sudden, because you're having that conversation, now now you're mad and so now you're not having a good time it's like because of the conversation itself not because I chose not to drink it's like well yeah now I'm more uptight because you won't drop it you know what I'm saying um but yeah it's just like it's it's such the norm it's so crazy how relatable that is Mm -hmm. and and how I can relate to that on so many levels it's people I want you to have fun Mm -hmm. I want you to loosen up right I I just want you to have a good time like old d this old d that right that's not me one whoever that old person is that you're thinking in their head my college self right my post college self my college my traumatized self my post breakup self if that's Mm -hmm. what you're referring to those were all the worst versions of myself Mm -hmm. and then to tell someone who has a personality you have a personality sober you have a personality right Right. now I have a personality sober I have a personality right right now to say that you want us to loosen up is almost offensive to Mm -hmm. me as if the, who I truly am as a person isn't right. enough. Right. Because the version that I am with alcohol in me, it's not really me. Right. And it, you won't even remember it tomorrow, so why do you care? Why do you care? Why? So we can go out to a club that's right. dimly lit and we can stand around because no one in L.A. dances right. and just hold a drink and just try to get into the Yeah, like, yeah. that's not a good time to me. Mm-hmm. And there are times where I go out and maybe I'll go to a club or maybe I'll go to a bar without drinking. And one, it just makes me so much more aware of how crazy people act when they mm-hmm. drink. I'm almost like you're annoying me. Right. Like you're, you're one, you're screaming in my ear. Yeah. Two, you're spitting on my face. Right. You notice all the little things. Three, you're stepping on everybody that you pass. And I'm starting yeah. to realize, you know, there's times where we go to really nice restaurants and everyone's so drunk that they don't realize how they've been acting. And I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm Is embarrassed. Right. Like, yeah, no, I'm the same way. And yeah, I've definitely toned down the drinking so much, which I'm, I have obviously so much mental clarity doing that. Um, also you start to just like self doubt and be like, who am I as a person when, you know, when you're hungover and it's just like, you just spiral like so unnecessarily. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we're both kind of on the same wave with that. I'm definitely like not sober by any means. Like I go on trips and I like, I have my fun. Um, but in a more standard, like routine setting, it's just like, it's just not it. Yeah. And this is not to say that I'm never going to pick up a glass of alcohol. I mm-hmm. more than likely will. I plan on getting drunk at my wedding. I plan right. on, you know, if my friend has a birthday party and I want to drink, I'm just making it not a common choice. Yeah. I don't want you to look at me and say automatically, like, she's right. going to be drinking tonight because 90% of the time I'm not. Mm-hmm. I've also found that not drinking in social settings has really helped my confidence mm-hmm. because people don't realize how much you use alcohol as a crutch. Oh, for sure. For confidence. They call it liquid courage. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize until I started going to those spaces without alcohol mm-hmm. how much courage you have to have. Do you Just, have, and it's a, it's a, you have to practice. Yeah, like it is a it skill is a that needs to be practiced going out sober. Um, but then you also realize that even like, you know, the men that you maybe wanted to have a conversation with when you were like drunk, sober, you're like, I don't even want to talk to that man. And even goes further to imagine dates. There was a time where I'd go on dates and I'd get blackout drunk with oh, yeah. a guy on the first date. And right. I'm like, 
Me too. What did we even talk about? What did we even talk about? Do I even like this man? Do I even like you? Right. And then you just have the memory of having such a good time with them. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, that's why I like you. But I'm like, I didn't even ask you any of the core questions that right. I would want to know, nor do I remember right. the quality of the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's so detrimental. Right. In dating intentionally now that you know I'm 27 and I consider right. myself you know, older, mm-hmm. more mature, I'm like, I don't even like the idea of having a date on the first drink or having a drink on the Got first, you. Day, I was like, mm-hmm. having a drink on the first date because I don't want my judgment to be clouded. Mm-hmm. I don't want that to be a crutch for mm-hmm. me getting along with you in our natural chemistry. Right. We should have chemistry with that alcohol right. or else you're not the person for me. Right. So I feel like that's really interesting and beautiful to look at as mm-hmm. people who, I don't know who's listening to this, maybe you're con- you know, considering dropping alcohol for an amount of time. You really do feel good mm-hmm. and it's very empowering. But again, it's not taboo. Right. This is not to talk down on anyone who drinks. No. I used to drink like a fish. I think everyone's on their own journey for sure with it. Um, yeah, and I'm not looking at my friends who drink more than me and thinking any type of way about it because, again, we're all on our own journeys. Right. Also, yeah, I'm about to turn 27 too, and I think age like has a huge part to play in all of that, especially because we feel it so much more, like the effects of it. Um, also, our frontal cortex, she's developed now. Yeah. So we're making big girl choices, and so I feel like – it, it, everyone in their own time for sure I loved and this is to go back to food I love 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 the overnight oats recipe mm-hmm. and I want you to know that I eat it every day it's okay? amazing. let's start to start off with yeah. but I want our listeners to know how to make this overnight oats yeah. recipe and guys I'll also tag her in this episode so that you can see it because it is amazing it's so good can you break it down do you have yeah. the measurements can, can you be specific yeah so you're going to do a half a cup of oats, oats of your choice. You can do steel cut, organic, whatever you want to do. Um, I've been typically going for the organic recently, so I'll do a half a cup of dry oats. I do one cup of milk, which is um, an, a milk alternative. It's a pretty clean ingredient. You can choose the milk of your choosing here. Um, I will do about a tablespoon of maple syrup. I add usually around a cup of yogurt. It's going to be like a Greek yogurt, a high protein yogurt. Again, you can be flexible with the flavor and what brand and all of that. Cinnamon. What else do I add to it? Vanilla extract. Vanilla extract. I've, I've studied her you recipe. Know, vanilla extract, uh, half a tablespoon of vanilla extract. It's pretty low. Um, and then you mix it all together. You could, I put chia seeds in it too. You can do chia seeds. You can put the fruit in it overnight if you want to. I like to top it with the fruit in the morning. So you put it in the fridge overnight. In the morning you pop it out. She's thicker, but she's like cool. Like I just love the consistency of it. I'll put strawberries or blueberries, top it with peanut butter. She's essential. A little bit more cinnamon and you're good to go. It's so good. It's so comforting. Like it's a little sweet treat in the morning. Like it just hits. It just hits. It's so crazy because it's so refreshing. Mm -hmm. And it's weird. It's weird to say that a breakfast food is refreshing, but it's like warm but cold but refreshing but filling but light but like airy and and comforting so comforting it's so nice I put my little twist onto it so what I do for my recipe I do the base all the same the chia seeds vanilla extract maple syrup a little bit of greek yogurt um she does cup I do like maybe like three big you know spoonfuls Mm -hmm. or maybe like two big spoonfuls uh, because it does add a little bit of like a tart to it and I'm not like I'm more of like creamy so it adds like a little bit of a tart I do blueberries and then cashew butter I love I don't know if I've ever had cashew butter. Cashew butter. I need to get on it. It's amazing. It's very expensive. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The economy these days. I'm like, guys, I need to get a cashew press. Yeah, it's something rough out here. Like, can we grow cashew? Like, how can we make it happen? I need to start making my own cashew butter. But it's because I stopped eating peanut butter because, Mm -hmm. one, peanut butter is, like, more inflammatory, like, of the nut butters, apparently. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm, like, going through this journey of, like, figuring out my health, and I feel like I have a lot of inflammation. And Mm -hmm. so trying to cut as many like inflammatory you know things mm-hmm. from my diet and so I just found cashew butter is is very similar to a peanut butter and it's creaminess and like mm-hmm. I it gives the same effect to me yeah so anyone out there who wants to find a peanut butter alternative if you don't like peanut butter if you're allergic cashew butter try it mm-hmm. um a couple more questions one of them is who is your idol not fitness idol could be anyone like who do you look up to mm. and why that's a hard question. I feel like I have people that I idolize for different reasons or look up to for different reasons. I would say right now my idol in life. And take your time. Do you put me on the spot? No. I just want to, it doesn't have to be your yeah. idol for life. It can be someone that you're inspired by, that you look mm-hmm. up to, that they like set a really good framework for how 
you has like maybe has shaped you or like you know someone that's inspired you in different ways or like changed your life in a certain way yeah so I would say I'm always always inspired by my first business mentor Kendall um she started in the fitness industry and now she does business coaching and her the way that she shows up has not changed since the minute that I came across her on social media and the impact that she has on people I mean I would not literally be sitting in front of you today if it were not for this woman. And so I feel like I I always look up to her and she's just such an inspiration and she just shows up so confidently as herself and she hasn't strayed in any sense. The more money she makes has not changed her. And um, she truly cares at her core to make an impact in this world and in my life she, she has. And, you know, that I've been able to impact so many people because of her, right, that domino effect. And so... She's just, she's always going to be someone I, like, inspire, like, I get inspiration from and I'm inspired by. I love that. And I really appreciate people who are authentically themselves. Mm -hmm. I feel like true self-love is being authentic and not feeling like you have to fit into a box. And if not, everybody understands you because we're not all meant to be understood and that's completely fine. So I really love that she's authentic and inspires confidence in you. So I think that's really beautiful. Um, So two different questions that I'm going to be ending off each podcast with. Mm -hmm. So the first one. And you could answer this or, you, you know, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. What is an insecurity of yours that you had to overcome and how did you overcome it? Now, this can be something that you've talked about already or maybe a different insecurity. Yeah. Okay. Insecurity that I've had to overcome. Um, honestly, it can be physical or anything. It can be anything, physical, mental, social. Yeah. I would say probably physically my nose Mm. I got bullied so much when I was younger and I didn't realize that you like a lot of people grow into it and even like looking back at pictures I was like yeah it was it was it didn't fit on my face um but that's something that I've had to I will I personally don't think I'd ever have it in me to get a nose job and so I think that that's something I've had to learn to love and now I like can see that it fits my face so much more but it's just like it's taken so much time to to get to that point where I'm like you know what, you're beautiful. Like, it does fit your face. And I don't need to think back on the people who, like, bullied me back in the day. I mean, we were in, like, sixth grade, you know? I love that. So it was pretty much, like, over time, you just grew to love it. It wasn't anything that you had to go out of your way and do? No, it wasn't. Well, so yes and no. Um, I think it's more so, like, I've had to... I've had to go out of my way to accept the fact that, like, this this is the way it looks, but now I can see it for what it is versus, like, see it for when I was so much younger, when it, like, didn't fit my face as well, and now it does, so. I love that. Okay, and the last question Mm -hmm. is, what do you love about yourself, and why? It could be physical, mental, social, anything. I think I kind of mentioned it in the, like, the overview that you gave me in the beginning, but my ability to communicate with people in a digestible way, I think that can come with anything that I do, not just like fitness and nutrition based, but I think that I can share a similar experience to a lot of people and be able to vocalize it in a way that they can truly understand it and get the the tips that I'm trying to like bring across. Like for example, not fitness and nutrition related. I've, I guess this is also an insecurity. I always struggled with my natural hair. So I'm really happy that I'm sitting here right now with my curly it's hair. It's stunning. But thank you. I've always struggled with that. And so even just being able to share my experience with that um, in a way that, is well spoken and understandable and digestible and people are like regardless if they felt this in their life or not they under they were able to understand um it's it's really I feel like it's a really beautiful quality to have so I love that no I love it well thank you so much Sarah for coming to the podcast we had an amazing conversation I'm happy that you were able to join us and you guys thank you so much for listening don't forget to like comment and subscribe and podcasts are going to be dropping bi-weekly so every other week stay tuned thank you so much thank you thanks for having me